Yeah. Well, good morning. Welcome to Pocono Evangelical Free Church. We're looking forward to worshiping together. I do have a, a couple of announcements to make mention. Uh, we're going to continue doing video series on Tuesday, 4 o'clock, on uh, the importance of the church. Uh, and uh, so just keep an eye out for that. Uh, also want to make mention that uh, we are back to a normal service for online. Uh, so last week we had it a little messed up with needing to do it on Monday as opposed to Sunday. But this week, uh, the service should be on today at 6.30, and moving forward, that's the way we'll continue to do it. I do want to make mention that there are daily breads in the back, so if you would uh, like any of those, feel free to take one. Uh, they're for you. All right, well, with those things in mind, let's go to the Lord and worship.
to go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, let's, uh, let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you so much that we can come together, that we can worship you, that we can sing praises to you. Lord, we consider Jesus and what he has done, his death, his resurrection, and Lord, the hope that we have in Jesus because of those things. Father, I pray that that would uh, just be uh, something that, 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 that warms our heart today as we consider that. Lord, I pray that you would help us to live uh, lives that glorify and honor your name. Father, I, I also want to lift up those who uh, are dealing with different things. I, I pray for mom. Uh, I just pray that you continue to help her in the midst of what she's been going through. Lord, help her to be able to gain weight here. Uh, and, and I know she's trying to work on that. Lord, I pray that you would help her for that so that she can have the surgeries that she needs to have moving forward. Father, I also want to lift up Julie to you. Thank you so much that uh, she got some good news. Uh, I pray that you would just continue to help her as she heals. Uh, even though things are looking good, Lord, right now, we, we know that she needs continued healing. So, Lord, we pray that you would continue to do the work that you've begun in her in that. Father, we thank you and praise you that we can uh, come before you. We thank you that we have uh, we have. Uh, hope in you, and may we always consider that. Lord, we thank you for the way you supply for our needs. Uh, Lord, I know that's something that's been impacting my heart this week, and thank you, Lord, for the way you provide. Yes. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
new series, really looking at this concept of what does it mean to follow Christ? And what does that not only look like, but how are we doing? How are we doing? I mean, if we put it on the Likert scale, you know, you know, from one being very poor or non-existence to five being great, you know, where are you? Are we settling for somewhere in the middle? Or are we really striving and growing to really have a great deep, intimate, meaningful relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and you know, how do we come to that? And, and we're going to look at two stories, and then I'm going to weave in a third story about Peter. So we're looking at Peter and his confession of who Jesus is. Then we look at Peter and his struggle with what Jesus was called to do. And then we're going to wrestle with Jesus' words, follow me, and what that means, and what that takes, and what that looks like. And then we're going to um, kind of take another story into it and incorporate it from uh, the book of John, John chapter 21, where we look at uh, Jesus again telling Peter, follow me. We often focus upon the question Jesus asks, you know, Peter, do you love me? And then he we focus on that and then feed my sheep. But ultimately at the end, Jesus twice tells Peter, follow me. The same words that we're going to be looking at. Our new series is from Matthew chapter 13. We're going to look at verses uh, 13 through 15 today uh, concerning the Son of Man. But our series, uh, 10 message series, will go all the way through verse 28 of the text. Uh, today, I, our, 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 uh, again, here's the 10 messages. And again, we see the first four messages relate to this first story uh, where Peter confesses Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then the second two messages we'll be looking at when, when Jesus tells Peter, get thee behind me, what? Satan, because he had his mind on man's interests. And you know, that's when we advocate for Satan's purposes, when our mind is focused on man's purpose, man's interests, rather than God's. And then the last four message we'll look at Christ's teaching on what it means uh, to follow him. So today we're going to be looking at, uh, again, those are the, the three parts, part one, part two, part three. Today we're going to be looking at the bold part, but I'm going to read um, all the way uh, through the, the, the end of uh, this context in Matthew chapter 16. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some said John the Baptist, some Elijah, 
others Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the mighty word of God, your word, and particularly the words of Christ here, and Peter's confession of who Christ was. We pray as we look at today that Jesus is the Son of Man and what that means, that the message might truly help us to understand how we start with understanding who Christ is. And may who Christ is impact who we are. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Kathy's getting a little bit stronger. Um, in fact, just yesterday she walked all the way down our trail to the river and then all the way back up. So that's a good sign. Uh, but uh, earlier this week, um, uh, she decided to uh, do some gardening or some workout. Um, and so she asked me to take the mulch. I had a big bag uh, of mulch and she asked me to take it up and so I took it up and um, opened it for her and I know she was mulching around um, particularly one of the areas that she has done and, and um, so I was going to go in and I decided not to go in she doesn't even know this so I started watering the, uh, the flowers and other things and kind of kept my eye out and then after a little bit I went up and sure enough she was just about finished so I carried the leftover of the, the, the mulch back down and I was just kind of checking on her, <laughs> you know, just, is she really okay? You know, is everything going to be all right? And, you know, with, with, with everything that's go, been going on, it's just one of those things that, that you're concerned about. Your concern is, is everything good? Is everything all right? And, and, and that's kind of where I, I started with that question. Is everything all right with your relationship with Jesus? But not is everything all right, but is everything great? You know, we, we really want to strive toward greatness in our relationship with Jesus Christ. We don't want it just to be okay or in the common way that people call good, you know, not, not the way the Word of God intrinsically uses the word good, but, you know, when people respond, yeah, I'm good, what does that mean? There's a big difference when somebody, when you ask somebody, you know, how are you doing? And they say, I'm really great. And, and that's the response we want to have when we're asked, how's your relationship with Jesus Christ today? It's great. But I think that often we settle for good, don't we? We settle for, well, it's all right, it's good. You know, it's okay, it's, it's good. And, and we really need to look at what is a relationship with Jesus Christ that's truly great, that's truly intimate, that's truly meaningful look like, looks like. And, and we, we start with this first part, who Christ is. This will be our first four messages. If you don't know Christ, you can't follow Christ. Let me say that again. If you don't truly know who Christ is, you can't truly follow Christ. And that's why the context is so important. Jesus, uh, according to the Apostle Matthew, is going to give us teaching on what it looks like to walk with Him, to follow Him. But before that, these two stories, the story of Peter's confession, and then the story of Peter's having his mind set on man's interest rather than God's, these two stories give to us a valuable understanding of the context of what it looks like to have a great walk with Jesus Christ. And today, we're looking at this whole idea of the Son of Man. Who is the Son of Man? What does that mean? 
And in fact, the wording is really kind of unique as we come to this first point, who do men say? But Jesus, Jesus doesn't just say, who do men say I am? As he does in the second part in verse 15. He says, who do you? Actually, the wording is you, but. The wording is very important. We'll get to that in a moment. But in this first thing, he says, not who do men say that I am? He says, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? The Son of Man am. Now, it's vitally important to realize that in the beginning of our verse, that he asked. Thayer says, to ask means to question. That's what we see here. But to ask also is more than just asking. It's the idea of this picture of questioning and going deeper and wrestling. And it even is translated in uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 15. Uh, Jesus, who is called, that's the exact same word, to ask, who is called Christ. Jesus, who is called Christ. Now, we see this word multiple times in our text. We see it in both verse 13. He asks his disciples, um, the next word, I'm sorry, who do men say? So he asks, who do men say? This next word, we see this multiple times. And we see that the um, that, that we see it, he asks his disciples saying, who do men say? And then later on he says again, he said, who do you say? So this word to say, what does it mean? And word study says it means to lay out an argument. You ever have to make yourself, make a case? You know, maybe you uh, decided to fight a ticket that was given to you. Well, what do you, what do you do? You think about how do I lay out my case? Um, I did that one time. In fact, it was a case in which uh, Pastor JJ and I had to go to court uh, because we were given a ticket that uh, was not true. And it basically said we had falsified our uh, inspection sticker. And we knew that wasn't true. And I even called the officer that gave JJ the ticket and said, we just had the windshield replaced. That's why. And they stuck it back on. And the, the police officer said, you know, well, that doesn't look right. And so he wrote up a ticket that we had falsified our inspection. And so we had to go to court and lay out our case that, you know, show that we had changed the windshield. And when I talked to the officer, he said, well, just go to court. I won't, I won't fight that. You know, that's no problem. But we had to lay out a case. And that's the idea of what this means. Jesus says, what is the case people are laying out about me? Who do men say? And then he says that I, the Son of Man. Now, I could go to many different contexts here. We can go to Daniel and understand why this phrase, the Son of Man, is so important. We can go to Revelation and look in the future why this phrase, Son of Man, is important. And if you go to Daniel, um, in fact, I, I, I even marked it in my Bible just to kind of uh, read a little bit to you of, of what the Son of Man and where the concept comes from. But in Daniel chapter 7 and... Um, uh, Verse 13, it says, I was watching in the night, this is uh, in the white night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with clouds of heaven. And then it talks about Jesus coming and being the Messiah. And it says, uh, his kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed, it shall be everlasting. And so we see this picture here of the importance of what the Son of Man is. Do you know that just in the book of Matthew, it's the most times it's used, Matthew uses this phrase, Son of Man. And most of the times he uses, it's a reference that Jesus uses of himself, as he does here. Jesus says, the Son of Man. Well, you know, anyone who knew Daniel knew what Jesus was saying. I'm that one. Amen. I'm the one in Daniel chapter 7. Verse 13 and 14, I will produce a kingdom that will last forever. And as Clark and as Gill and as uh, Benson and as Barnes, a number of different people say, what Jesus was basically saying when he says, I the Son of Man, he's saying, I'm the Messiah. I am, as we see Peter's response, I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
But I think it's fascinating that Jesus adds that here. Who do men say, I, the Son of Man, am? Are we certain of who Jesus is? One of the contexts that we'll go to later, one of the stories we'll go to later, is the rich young ruler coming to Jesus and saying, good master. Now, that term is used good, not the way I've been using the idea of having a good relationship. That's used in the intrinsic way. God only is good. And Jesus says, do you really believe I'm God? You go to your text and you say that. Now, he didn't say that, right? But that's exactly what Jesus says. Do you really believe I'm God? He says, why do you call me good? Only God is good. Are you going to really trust that I am who you are saying I am? That's important. And Jesus knew who he was and he didn't backtrack from it, did he? 30 times in the book of Matthew. <laughs> I, the son of man. And Daniel says the Son of Man is the one who will have the everlasting kingdom. He is the Messiah. Pulpit commentary goes one step further and says the term Son of Man is a reference to the incarnation. Why? Because Jesus was perfect God. And now he becomes perfect man. And it's vitally important as we study the incarnation to understand what that is. The incarnation is not Jesus being born and that being the beginning. No, that's only the beginning of him being the perfect man. He always was perfect God. In the beginning, John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word what? was God. And then verse 14, and the Word became flesh. Incarnation. Philippians chapter 2 says that Jesus dwelt in the position of deity and did not regard that a thing to be grass, but emptied himself. That's the word kenosis. The incarnation was Jesus emptying himself. To become man. But he didn't give it up. He still was perfect God. And perfect man. As pulpit commentary points out. Now let's look at a few of the contexts. In which Jesus used the son of man. In, later on in our text. In chapter. Uh, in verse 27 and 28. He says for the son of man will come. So he talks about his future coming. He talks about the transfiguration. Uh, some of them would not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in His glory. And, and we look at the transfiguration in that context. Of the 30 times that it's used in uh, Matthew, Jesus uh, refers to Himself in some really important ways. Remember when uh, the paralytic uh, person was not able to get to Jesus and his friends dug? Because it was like moss and... Uh, straw, they dug a hole out of the roof and lowered him down. Do you know that that was on the Sabbath? And people were concerned about people doing any work on a Sabbath. And they considered, they made up something that when Jesus did a miracle, it was a work. So it shouldn't be done on the Sabbath. Can you imagine that? That means you can't get saved on the Sabbath. <laughs> That'd be pretty sad, wouldn't it? But that's some of the foolishness that can come in. And he says, but, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. I'm sorry, the issue was forgiving sins there, not the Sabbath. But that's, the next one is about the Sabbath. Arise, take up your bed. And then in chapter 12, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And so he was talking about the Sabbath. That was the context that I started with. And then he who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. We see over and over and over and over again, Jesus is referencing the importance of who he was. He was the Son of Man, Messiah, as Clark and Barnes and Benson and others, Gill says. He was the Messiah. Now, why is that so important? Now, notice what their response is. So they said, well, some say, some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Some say Jeremiah. Some say another prophet. And I like what Guzik says. Guzik says they underestimate Jesus when they do that. 
to compare the Messiah to even Moses would be foolishness. To compare he who was perfect, he who is perfect God, perfect man, to any other man would be foolishness. And I agree with Guzik that don't get caught up in others. Even if they're great men like Moses and Elijah and Jeremiah and John the Baptist. What did John the Baptist say about Jesus? I'm not even worthy to untie the sandal, his sandals. I'm not even worthy of that. I'm not, I'm not even worthy to be compared to him, is what he was saying. Don't compare me. You know, in the Christian faith, we get very comparative, don't we? And we need to get our focus back on Jesus. This is what understanding who Jesus is, is why it's so important. Because when we understand who Jesus is, nothing else compares. Now, one other text that's really important is John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, right? That he gave his only begotten son. Do you realize that Jesus is talking about the son of man there? He is actually bringing new truth to Nicodemus and new understanding to Nicodemus who needed to understand why the Messiah, the Son of Man. Now Nicodemus was well educated. He would have known Daniel and he would have understand Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13 and 14 and he would understand when Jesus says Son of Man who Jesus was talking about. Jesus wanted Nicodemus to understand that the Messiah was there to save him from his sin, not to save Israel from Rome. And that's an important thing. A lot of times we're so concerned about Jesus saving us from this or that or that or this. And the key is that Jesus save us from our sin. If we understand who the Messiah is as Jesus speaks of it, to Nicodemus, it really makes a huge difference. Let me read for you verse 13. I'm going to read actually through verse 15. I just have verse 13 and 14 up there. And I already mentioned John 3:16, right? For God so loved the world. For no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. It's a fascinating statement. It, it, it speaks of the omnipresence of Jesus as I understand it in this context. And, and Jesus is, again, talking about himself. And he's speaking and he says, no one's, no one's been like me, Nicodemus. I am the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You see what is going before for God so loved the world Jesus was explaining to Nicodemus the role of the Messiah as it related not to just being him king of kings lord of lords but of him being king of kings lord of lord over sin and that we could be saved by the grace of God you see the gospel and who Jesus is, the Son of Man, because it ties back in that text to the gospel, that should radically impact how we follow Jesus. When we ask the question, how's your walk with Jesus? This picture of who he is, the Son of Man, Messiah, who was lifted up on the cross, that if we believe in him, we would have everlasting life, eternal life. That is more important than anything else in your or my life, isn't it? And when we get that, we are on the first step, the first key step to having a great relationship with Jesus Christ. When we forget that, we're missing out on what it really looks like to have this deep, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. And so, I ask us the question in application, when are we distracted? When are we distracted? You know, Clark says something very important about Jesus' 
first question when he asks these questions, who do men say? Clark says, Jesus is an ignorant. Jesus knew what men were saying. Jesus knew, as Guzik put, that they were underestimating who he was. Jesus was asking the question to set up the next question. And he didn't want his disciples to get distracted by what people were saying. He didn't want his disciples to become distracted to think that, oh, this is a great prophet in our midst. And that's why he says, who do men say, I, the son of man? Because the disciples at this point in Matthew chapter 16 have been with Jesus long enough to understand that he is more than just a prophet. We'll see next week that Peter professes Jesus as the Christ, the son of the living God. We'll see the importance of that. But here... This question, when do I get distracted? When do you get distracted by what others are saying? By how others view things? We do it, don't we? We get caught up in that. We get very distracted. We sometimes get so distracted, it consumes us. We become worried. And the first thing is, when we are worried about how we look. Isn't that true? When I'm too worried about how I look, or when I want to look good, or when I anticipate somebody might interpret this negatively, then you know what? I can get very distracted. You know, the disciples were going to have to fight a huge battle. And that battle was, Jesus isn't just a prophet. He is the Messiah. He is perfect God, perfect man who came to die for your sins. And that message, as we see in the book of Acts, first delivered by Peter to the Mass, that message was a message that was essential in anyone's first step to have a great walk with Jesus. And so that message today for us is so important. Do I get worried about what others are thinking? We'll look at a text where many were doing that. And maybe that's why they weren't seeing Jesus for who he really was. Secondly, when we esteem others too highly, that includes the pastor. If you esteem somebody too highly, they get in the way of our view of Christ. Yes, pastors. Yes, you. Yes, all of us should represent Jesus and his example. But we're not Jesus. Amen? And, and so we need to be very, very careful. I've had people literally say to me, literally say to me, the reason I don't follow Jesus is because so-and-so did this. They don't follow Jesus because of what? Not what Jesus did, but what somebody else did? You have way too much high esteem for man, right? That, that's just thinking too highly upon somebody else and then obviously being disappointed. And, and that goes for anyone in our lives. You know, let's not put them on the level of God. Let's not put them on the level of perfect man and perfect God. And that's the third point. When we do not esteem Jesus highly enough, that's a real issue in our lives. That was the problem with a rich young ruler that will look at that story later on again. I keep coming back to it. I knew I would come back to it multiple times in this message, but we'll actually take a deeper look at it later on in our series. But the rich young ruler was basically saying, hey, I want eternal life. And Jesus basically says to him, here's the key, follow me. He uses the exact same words we'll see in verse 24. The rich young ruler wasn't willing to recognize who Jesus was. He wasn't willing to esteem Jesus high enough. That doesn't matter. We can look at the rich young ruler and categorize him as one of the biggest idiots. <laughs> He had the opportunity to follow Jesus, and he let it go because of his riches. 
But that's you and me today. You and me today. Us, we, when we decide to do something that's not following Jesus, is basically saying, Jesus, you're not good enough, or you're not big enough, or you're not, you see what I'm saying? We're not esteeming Jesus in the position that Jesus should be esteemed. That's why this first step is so important in following Jesus. If we really believe that Jesus is the Son of Man, perfect God, perfect man, then in believing that, it should make a difference. And when it makes a difference, it sets us forth in a course of a great walk with Jesus. And then finally and fourthly, when we get caught up in the temporal, three weeks ago I talked about the temporal perspective with suffering. But it doesn't have to just be suffering. It can be things in our life. It can be people in our life. It can be positions in our life. It can be work in our life. It can be neighbors in our life. It can be all kinds of things. When we have a temporal perspective, it takes away from the eternal perspective that we see in Daniel chapter 7 that I read earlier. <clears throat> that Jesus is about the everlasting kingdom. Seek first not what? The kingdom of earth, but what? The kingdom of what? Heaven, right? Seek for His kingdom, the eternal one. And that's what's really important here. And that brings us to our second point. Jesus then goes from them saying, well, some say this, some say that, some say this. And then He says, you. And A.T. Robertson points out, because the our, our translations don't bring this out. In fact, in mine, I start with but. The word but is uh, contrasting. Or distinguishing something from something else, according to Thayer. It's this idea of distinguishing. <clears throat> but Jesus really starts with, now normally you would say, but you. Jesus changes the order. And Matthew, by the inspiration of the Spirit of God, remembers the order that Jesus gave. Because it impacted him. It impacted his soul. And the Spirit of God brings it to mind. And Jesus didn't start with, but you. He starts with you. <laughs> it's a little bit like, you know, when you see your kids doing something, and you say, hey, <laughs> and you say their name. And A.T. Robertson points out, he says, note the emphatic position of the word you, of the personal pronoun you. It's a little bit like Jesus saying, Chris, Sue, Jack, you know, and I could go all the way across here. You know, it's like I'm pointing to you and saying, you know, hey, I want to talk to you, Chris. I want to talk to you, Sue. I want to talk to you, Jack. You know, what does it mean? You know, I want to talk to you, Ron. I'm just going to talk to these people over here. <laughs> you, Rachel. You know, what does that look like? When we really understand that Jesus is coming and saying, you. As A.T. Robertson says, the Greek here is fairly clear. Jesus is putting them on the spot. As Clark says, he's giving them an opportunity to declare their faith. And when it comes to following Jesus, when it comes to our walk with Jesus, Jesus is going to be emphatic and say, hey, you, you, Kathy. You know, he's going to point the finger and just say, you. So, but you, who do you say? Now, we've already looked at that phrase. Uh, by the way, the phrase I am was in the first one, too, and I'm going to get to that specifically. Jesus is, uses the phrase, but you or you but say I am. And he uses the word that they had already heard from John chapter 8 and verse 58. When Jesus, speaking of Abraham, says, before Abraham was what? I am. Now, understanding that is vitally important. Why do they pick up stones to try to kill him? Because Jesus had equated himself to eternal God. 
By saying I am in that way means I always was, I always will be. It's the same thing we see in Exodus where uh, Moses is approached by God and God says, and Moses says, who shall I tell them you are? And God says, I am what? Who I am? It's the same thing from the Hebrew to the Greek. Now this word is not used as much. You think I am is used a ton of times. It's used 146 times in the New Testament. 52 times it's used by the Apostle John, the one who mentioned that text where Jesus says, I am. And, and just look at some of the context in the book of John. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am from above. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I'm continuing the I am there. I am the vine in chapter 15. In the book of John, Jesus uses this concept or the Spirit of God uses John to reflect Jesus' words, I am. And now he says to the apostles, you, you Chris, you Sue, you Jack, you Ron, you Rachel, we can go on and on. You, who do you say that I am? We need this every single day in our life. We need this challenge because we can go on our merry way and forget. We can go on our merry way and not recognize the importance of articulating in our quiet times in the morning. If you don't have your quiet time in the morning, you can still do this in the morning. Of saying, Jesus, you are God, perfect God, perfect man. Help me to follow you today. That's why in Luke chapter 9 and verse 23, Jesus says, if you want to follow me, take up your cross, what? Daily and follow me. Daily. Or another way to put it, every single day we need this. And it must start with recognizing who Jesus truly is, the I am. Now, this is about confession. I'll get into more confession next week as we look at Peter's great confession. But, but we'll get into more of that. But I, really what Jesus is doing is he's giving them an opportunity to confess him. To confess. And, and I, I thought of three scriptures, and we're going to get into more, like I said, of this next week. But I thought vitally important for us today to realize that Jesus is asking them to confess him. And Jesus says something in the book of Matthew. He says, whoever confesses me before men, him I will what? Confess before my Father who is in heaven. You know, when people, men were saying, you know, maybe he's John the Baptist. You know, maybe he's even Elijah. They're giving him, you know, like, you know, maybe he's Jeremiah. Or maybe one of the other prophets. They weren't confessing him. They're actually confessing somebody else. This is the Messiah. Perfect God. Perfect man. We must confess him. That's where we must start. And if we truly believe Jesus is God, he's perfect God, perfect man, then that should impact everything we do. Some wouldn't confess it. Look at John chapter 12. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed. Many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not what? Confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. These people knew who Jesus was. Let me say that again. These people knew who Jesus was. They knew he was the Son of Man. Maybe they didn't fully comprehend the implications of that, but they believed it says. But maybe... And I can't judge their hearts, but maybe they believed like the demons. They knew who Jesus was. They believed God, right? But they didn't what? They didn't confess him. And so the first step, the first step of having a great relationship with Jesus Christ is confessing him, is the gospel. And do you know the gospel? It's clear. The gospel, we must confess him. 
That's what it says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you what? You will be saved. Notice it brings what? Belief and the type of belief. The belief that confesses, Jesus, you are God. That's not, I know you are God, Jesus, but I'm going to do it my own thing. That's what the rulers who believed in Jesus did. We're not going to confess him. We don't want to get thrown out. We believe. We're not going to confess. No, the gospel is, I believe Jesus. And the first step to a great walk, a great relationship with Jesus Christ is this. I completely and fully embrace who you are. Now, they had no excuse because Isaiah made it very clear who this son who would be born, who he was. And we find in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, when we ask this question, who, who do we say Jesus is? It was told to them who he was. And his name shall be called what? Wonderful Counselor. Really, two names there, but that is where I'm going to start with. Understanding that every day I need this wonderful counselor in my life. I can't do without him. Amen. I need him. Yes, people call me a counselor. And I have degrees in counseling. But I'm not wonderful counselor, <laughs> but Jesus is. And so when I counsel, my goal is always to bring him in. Secondly, notice what it says, mighty God. How can you get around that? Unto us a son is born, and his name shall be called wonderful counselor. What? Mighty God. Can you get around that? Uh, to me, it's very clear. Uh, unless the scriptures aren't clear. <laughs> but they are, amen? amen? That's why when I said for the third time now, I'm going to refer back to the rich young ruler. When Jesus says, why do you call me good? Only God is good. Are you giving me the position of God in your life? Jesus is mighty God. Having a great relationship, a great walk with Jesus means I accept what he says because he's God. And if he's God, he knows what? He knows best. That's been hard for me. Particularly with Kathy being very sick. That hasn't been easy for me. That's been a, a battle for me to really surrender. To really realize that, hey, there are things in my life, I wouldn't do it as God does it. You know, if I were to do it as God, you know, if I had the power, first time Kathy was sick, I would have healed everything. God has a different purpose, amen? amen? And I have to say, you're God, not me. Mighty God, everlasting Father. This brings the eternal part into it. God is always looking at things. You know why God's way is not my way and God's thoughts are not my thoughts? Because God's ways and God's thoughts are always eternal and always infinite. And the eternality of God is always brought forth. And the Spirit of God brings that forth in our life so that we can understand what God wants. Everlasting Father, and then it ends with, aren't you glad Jesus isn't just mighty God, everlasting Father, wonderful Counselor, that He is the Prince of what? Peace. Do you know the gospel is the gospel of peace? Do you know that Romans chapter 15, um, cha chapter 5 and verse 1 says that we who are justified by faith have peace with God? It's speaking of the gospel there. It goes on to talk about we were enemies, we were sinners, we were ungodly. But God demonstrated his love to us in that while we were yet what? Sinners. Christ died for us. That's why we have peace with God, because the Prince of Peace has come. And that 
is who Jesus is. He is wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father. But he came to bring peace between us and God. And as we close today, may we embrace these truths so that we may not just have an okay or maybe somewhat good relationship and walk with Christ, but may we have a great relationship with Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word, its power, its meaning, its significance. This message is so important for us today. Help us to not just embrace it. Help us for us to really understand the importance of recognizing who Jesus is. And we pray this in his name.